If only they realised what they were doing, laughed old Porteous, leaning over the side of the car. They were a clutter of rustics, cuddling vegetable marrows, cauliflowers, apples, and other stuffs, passing into a village church some miles south of Birmingham. Humanity has been doing that, performing that rite, since thousands of years before the first syllable of recorded time, I suppose, though not always in quite such a refined manner. And then there are maypoles of all indecorous symbols, and beating the bounds, a particularly interesting survival with, originally, a dual function. First they beat the bounds to scare the devils out, and then they beat the small boys that their tears might propitiate the rain goddess. Such propitiation having been found to be superfluous in this climate, they have ceased to beat the urchins, a great pity, but an admirable example of myth adaptation. Great Britain swarms with such survivals, some as innocuous and bland as this harvest festival, others far more formidable and guarded secrets. At least, that was so when I was a boy. Did I ever tell you how I lost my arm? No, I replied, yawning. Go ahead. But I hope the tale has entertainment value, for I am feeling deliciously sleepy. Old Porteous leaned back and lit a cigar. He had started his career with fifteen pounds, and turned this into seven figures by sheer speculative genius. He seemed to touch nothing which did not appreciate. He is a fat, shrewd, cynical, and very charitable in an individual, far-sighted way. A copious but discriminating eater and drinker, to all appearances just a superb epitome of a type. But he has a less mundane side which is highly developed being a devoted amateur of music with a trained and individual taste. And he owns the finest collection of keyboard instruments in Europe, the only one of his many possessions I very greatly envy him. Music, indeed, was the cause of our being together that Sunday morning in August, for I make my living out of attempting to criticise it, and we were driving to Manchester for a hearty Sibelius concert. When I was a boy of thirteen, he began, my father accepted the living of Reedley End in Essex. There was little competition for the curé, as the place had a notable reputation for toughness in the diocese, and the stipend was two hundred and fifty pounds a year, and a house which in size and amenities somewhat resembled a contemporary poorhouse. However, the prospect appealed to my dear old dad's zeal, for he was an evangelist by label and temperament. Reedley End was in one of those remote corners of the country which are backwaterish to this day, and was then almost as cut off from the world as a village in Tibet. It sprawled along the lower slopes of a short, narrow valley, was fifteen miles from a railway station, and its only avenue to anywhere was a glorified cart track. It was peopled by a strange tribe, aloof, dar, bitter, and revealing copious signs of intensive interbreeding. They greeted my father's arrival with contemptuous nonchalance, spurned his ministrations, and soon enough broke his spirit. I can do nothing with them he groaned half to himself and half to me. They seem to worship other gods than mine. There was a very real justification for their bitterness. Reedley End was, perhaps, the most arid spot in Britain. Drought, save in very good years, was endemic in that part of Essex, and I believe a bad spring and dry summer still causes great inconvenience and some hardship to this day. There had been three successive drought years before our arrival, with crop failures, heavy mortality amongst the beasts, and actual thirst the result. The distress was great and growing, and a mood of venomous despair had come with it. There was no one to help them. 
The day of governmental paternalism had not yet dawned, and my father's predecessor's prayers for rain had been a singularly ineffectual substitute. They were off the map and left to stew in their own juice, or rather perish from the lack of it. Men in such a pass, if they cannot look forward for succour, many times look back. In February they went forth to sow again, and my father told me they seemed to him in a sinister and enigmatic mood. I may say my mother had died five years before. I was an only child, and through being my father's confidant, was old and wise for my age. Their habitual aloofness had become impenetrable, and all, even the children, seemed imbued with some communal purpose, sharers of some communal secret. One morning my father went to visit an ancient bedridden crone, who snubbed him with less consistent ruthlessness than the rest of his fearsome flock. To his astonishment he found the village entirely deserted. When he entered the ancient's cottage, she abruptly told him to be gone. "'It is no day for you to be abroad, parson,' she said peremptorily. "'Go home and stay indoors.' In his bewilderment my father attempted to solve the humiliating mystery, and decided to visit one of the three small farmers who strove desperately to scrape a living for themselves and their hinds from the parched acres, and who had treated him with rough courtesy. His farmhouse was some two miles away, and my father set out to walk there. But on reaching the outskirts of the village, he found his way barred by three men placed like sentries across the track. They waved him back without a word, and when he made some show of passing them, grew so threatening and their gestures so unmistakable that my father cut short his protests and came miserably home again. That night I couldn't sleep. My father's disturbed mood had communicated itself to me. Some time in the course of it I went to my window and leaned out. A bitterly northerly wind was blowing and suddenly down it came a horrid, thin cry of agony that seemed to have been carried from afar. It came once again, diminished and cut short. I crept shivering and badly scared back to bed. If my father had heard it, he made no reference to it next morning, when the village seemed itself again, and though the children were brooding and subdued, their elders were almost in good spirits, ruthlessly jocund, like homecoming lynchers. I made that comparison, of course, long afterwards, but I know it to be psychologically true. My father had made valiant and pathetic attempts to get hold of the village youth, and managed to coax together a meagre attendance at a Sunday school. On the next Sunday one of the dozen was missing. This was a girl of about my own age the only child of a farm labourer and his wife. He was a foreigner, a native of Sussex, and a sparklingly handsome fellow of the pure Saxon type. His wife had some claims to be a beauty too, and was much fairer than the average of those parts. The result was an oddly lovely child, as fair and rosy as her father. She shone out in the village like a golden oriole in a crew of crows. She aroused my keenest curiosity, the bud of love, I suppose, and I spent much of my time spying on her from a shy distance. When she failed to turn up that Sunday, my father went round to her parents' cottage. They were both at home. The man was pacing up and down the kitchen, his face revealing fury and grief. The mother was sitting in front of the fire, wearing an expression my father found it hard to analyse. It reminded him of the appearance often shown by religious maniacs in their less boisterous moments, ecstatic, exalted, yet essentially unbalanced. When he asked after the little girl, the father clenched his fists and swore fiercely. The woman, without turning her head, muttered, She'll be coming to school no more. 
This ultimatum was naturally not good enough for my father, who was disagreeably affected by the scene. He asked where she was. She'd been sent away. Where to? he asked. But at this she became a raging virago and ordered my father to go and mind his own business. He turned to the man, who seemed on the verge of an outburst, but she muttered something my father couldn't catch, and he ran from the room. Late that night my dad heard a tap on his study window. It was the father. Sir, he said, I'm away. They're devils here. Your little girl, asked my father, horrified. They've taken her, he replied hoarsely. I don't know why and I don't know where she's gone, but I know I shan't see her no more. As for my wife, I hate her for what she's done. She says they'll kill me if I try to find her. They'd kill me if they knew I was here. My father implored him to tell him more, promised him sanctuary and protection, but all he said was, Avenge her, sir, and vanished into the night. Naturally, my father was at a loss what to do. He even enlisted my more than willing aid. But all I succeeded in doing was verifying the agonizing fact that my darling had gone, and taking a terrific beating from persons unknown one night when I was snooping near the cottage. In the end, my father wrote a confidential letter to the Colchester police, outlining the circumstances. But I suppose his tale was so vague and discreet that, though some inquiries were made by a thick-skulled, pot-bellied constable, nothing whatsoever came of them. But my father was a marked man from the moment of this peeler's appearance and audible and impertinent interruptions punctuated his services. Realising he was beaten, he made up his mind, with many tears and self-reproaches, to resign at the end of the year. The week after the little girl's disappearance there was a lovely two days' rain, and the spring and summer were a farmer's Elysian dreams. My father, with pathetic optimism, hoped this copious, if belated, answer to his prayers would improve his status with his iron-fleeced flock. Instead, he experienced a unanimous and shattering ostracism. In despair, he wrote to his bishop, but the Episcopal Council was couched in too general and booming terms to be efficacious in converting the denizens of Reedley End. And one day, it was August, the fields shone with a mighty harvest, and it was time to bring it home. The valley divided the cornlands of Reedley into two areas tilled against the slight slopes. Those facing north were noticeably less productive than those on the south, and do not concern us. Those southern fields were open and treeless, with one exception, a comparatively small circular field in the very middle of the tilled expanse. This was completely hemmed in by evergreens, yews and home oaks. Not a single deciduous tree interrupted the dark barrier. In the centre of this field was a stone pillar about eight feet high. I was forced to be by myself for many hours a day, and I spent many of them roaming the countryside and peopling it with the folk of my fancy. The local youth regarded me without enthusiasm, but young blood is thicker than old, and they did not keep me in rigid Coventry, though they were very guarded in their replies to my questions. This circular field stirred an intense curiosity within me, and all my wanderings on the southern slopes seemed to bring me, sooner or later, to its boundaries. Eventually I summoned up courage to ask a lad who had shown traces of cordiality if the field had a name. For some reason, I was sure it had. He looked at me oddly, nervously and angrily, and replied, It's the good field, and naught to do with you. After the little girl's disappearance, I was convinced, vaguely but certainly, that this field was concerned with it. Intuition, I suppose. Now that, I interrupted, 
is a word that baffles me, and the dictionary seems to know no more than I do. In a way, I agree, laughed old Proteus. I could answer you negatively and quite accurately by saying that it is a mode of apprehension unknown to women. But I believe an intuitive judgment to be a syllogism of which the premises are in the unconscious, the conclusion in the conscious. Though retrospective meditation can sometimes resolve it into a normal thought process. I have often done so in the case of big deals. It is the speed of the intuitive process which is so valuable. And now I hope you are a wiser man. Anyway, I conceived a fascinated horror of the field, a shivering curiosity concerning it I longed to satisfy. One evening, early in March, I determined to do what I had never dared before, walk out into the field and examine the stone pillar. It was almost dusk and not a soul in sight. When I'd surmounted a small but deep ditch, broken through between two yews, and stood out in that strange place under a hurrying, unstable sky, I felt a sense of extreme isolation. Not, I think, the isolation of being alone in a deserted place, but such as one would experience if alone and horribly conspicuous amongst a hostile crowd. However, I fought down my fears and strode forward. When I reached the pillar I found it was square, and surrounded by a small, cleared expanse of neatly tiled stone. This stone was thickly stained with what appeared to be red rust. The pillar itself was heavily pitted and indented about a third from its top with such regularity as suggested an almost obliterated inscription of some kind. I clasped the pillow with my arms, tucked my legs round it, and heaved myself up till I could touch its top. This I found to be hollowed out into a cup. I stretched up farther and pushed my fingers down. The next moment I was lying on my back and wringing my fingers, for if I had dipped my hand into molten lead, I couldn't have known as sharp as scald. This emptied my little bag of courage, and, with zero at the bone, I got up and ran for it. As I stumbled forward, I took one look over my shoulder, and it seemed to me there was a dark figure standing by the pillar and reaching high above its top, and all the time I gasped homewards I felt I had a follower and the pursuit was not called off till I flung myself through the rectory door. "'What's the matter?' asked my father. "'You shouldn't run like that. And you've cut your hand. Go and bathe it.' They started to reap in the second week of August, and I found the process of great interest, for it was the first harvest I had seen. I hovered about the outskirts of the activity, fearing my reception if I ventured nearer. I found they were working in towards the round field from all points of the compass, and, young and inexperienced as I was, it seemed to me that the people were in a strange mood, or rather mood cycle, for at times there would be outbursts of wild singing, with horse play and gesticulation, and at others they would be even more morose and silent than had been their sombre wont. And day after day, they drew nearer the round field. They reached it from all sides almost simultaneously by about noon on a superbly fine day, and then, to my astonishment, they all stopped work and went home. That was on a Tuesday, and they did nothing the next day in the fields, though they were anything but idle. There was incessant activity in the village of a sort which perplexed my father greatly. It struck him that something of great importance was being prepared. The hive was seething. Needless to say, no knowledge of it was much safe to him. He discovered by humiliating experience that a meeting of the older men was held in what was known as Odrive's Field, for the sentries posted round all the approaches to it brusquely and menacingly refused him entrance. 
Now, whether it was our old friend, intuition, or not, I was convinced these plans and consultations concerned the round field, and that something was due to be done there on the morrow. So I crept out of the house an hour before dawn, leaving a note on the hall table telling my father not to worry. I took with me three slices of bread and butter and a bottle of water. I made my way to the round field by a devious route so as to avoid passing through the village, creeping along the hedgerows and keeping a sharp lookout with eye and ear. I have said that a ditch encircled the field, and in it I crouched down between two yews, well away from the gate. By creeping into the space where their branches touched, I believed I could spy out undetected. Dawn broke fine, but very heavy and close, and there were red strata of clouds to the east as the sun climbed through them. To my surprise no one appeared at six, their usual hour for starting work, nor at seven, eight, or nine, when I ate half my bread and butter and sipped the bottle. By ten o'clock I had made up my mind that nothing would happen and I'd better go home, when I heard voices in the field behind me, and knew it was too late to retreat if I'd wanted to. I could see nothing ahead of me save the high, white wheat, but presently I heard more voices, and two men with sickles came cutting their way past me, and soon I could see an arc of a ring of them slashing towards the centre. When they had advanced some fifty yards I had a better view to right and left and a very strange sight I beheld. The villagers, mostly old people and children, were streaming through the gates. All were clad in black with wreaths of corn around their neck. They formed in line behind the reapers and moved slowly forwards. They made no sound. I heard not a single child's cry, but stared in a rapt way straight before them. Slowly and steadily the reapers cut their way forward. By this time the sun had disappeared, and a dense cloud bank was spreading from the east. By four o'clock the reapers had met in the centre round the last small patch of wheat by the stone pillar. And there they stopped, laid down their sickles, and took their stand in front of the people. For perhaps five minutes they all stayed motionless with bowed heads and then they lifted their faces to the sky and began to chant. And a very odd song they sang, one which made me shiver beneath the yew branches. It was mainly in the minor mode, but at perfectly regular intervals it transposed into the major in a tremendous but perfectly controlled cry of exultation and ecstasy. I have heard nothing like it since, though a spiritual, sung by four thousand god-drunk negroes in Georgia, faintly reminded me of it. But this was something far more formidable, far more primitive. In fact, it seemed like the oldest song ever sung. The last fierce sustained shout of triumph made me tremble with some unnameable emotion, and I longed to be out there shouting with them. When it ended they all knelt down save one old, white-bearded man with a wreath of corn around his brow, who, taking some of the corn in his right hand, raised it above his head and stared into the sky. At once four men came forward and, with what seemed like large trowels, began digging with them. The people then rose to their feet, somewhat obstructing my view. But soon the four men had finished their work and stood upright. Then the old man stepped out again, and I could see he was holding what appeared to be a short iron bar. With this he pounded the earth for some moments. Then, picking up something, it looked as if he dropped it into a vessel, a dark metal pot, I fancied, and paced to the stone pillar, raised his right arm, and poured the contents into the cup at the pillar's top. At that moment, a terrific flash of lightning cut down from the clouds and enveloped the pillar in mauve and devilish flame, and there came such a piercing blast of thunder that I fell backwards into the ditch. When I'd struggled back, 
the rain was hurling itself down in such fury that it was bouncing high off the lanes of stiff soil. Dimly through it I could see that all the folk had prostrated themselves once more. But in two minutes the thundercloud had run with the squall, and the sun was blazing from a clear sky. The four men then bound up the corn in that last patch, and placed the sheaf in front of the pillar. After which the old man, leading the people, paced the length of the field, scattering something from the vessel in the manner of one sowing. And he led them out of the gate, and that was the last I saw of them. Now somewhere I felt that if they knew I'd been watching them, it would have gone hard with me. So I determined to wait for dusk. I was stiff, cold, and hungry, but I stuck it till the sun went flaming down, and the loveliest afterglow I ever remember had faded. While I waited there, a resolve had been forming in my mind. I had the most intense desire to know what the old man had dropped in the hollow on the pillar, and curiosity is in all animals the strongest foe of fear. Every moment that emotion grew more compelling, and when at last it was just not dark, it became overmastering. I stumbled across as fast as I could to the pillar, looking neither to the right nor left, clambered up and thrust down my hand. I could feel small pieces of what might have been wood, and then it was as if my forefinger were caught and gripped. The most agonizing pain shot up my arm and through my body. I fell to the ground and shook my hand wildly to free my finger from that which held it. In the end it clattered down beside me and splintered on the stone. And then the blood streamed from my fingers, which had been punctured to the bone. Somehow I struggled home, leaving a trail of blood behind me. The next day my arm was swollen up like a black bladder. The morning after it was amputated at the shoulder. The surgeon who operated on me came up to my father in the hospital and held something out to him. I found this embedded in your son's finger, he said. What is it? asked my father. A child's tooth, he replied. I suppose he's been fighting someone. "'Someone with a very dirty mouth.' "'And that's why,' said old Porteous. "'Though I have none of my own, "'I have ever since shown the greatest respect to the gods of others.'